Welcome to another episode of the Dumbro Podcast. Today I have something very different for you. I'll be speaking to a guest named Aslan Hidayat. He's an overseas-born Uyghur activist who has a very large following online and is an English source of information for many people concerned about the stories they hear coming out of Xinjiang. In this interview, I question some of the red flags with the foreign narrative on Xinjiang, which isn't a very popular thing to do, but I'll also explain in the interview why I think it is an important thing that we should be doing. When interviewing Aslan, I didn't really want to have a conflict, so you might find I don't push too much after mentioning some specific areas of concern, and instead we cover a large variety of topics in a more general manner. I may seem like I'm playing devil's advocate with some of my questions, and I am somewhat, especially when asking about religion. However, it's founded in the idea that the version of Islam in Xinjiang is artificial or suppressed, according to activists. Therefore, I wanted to find out what needs to be changed in order for it to be called authentic. There, of course, probably won't be one single consensus or interpretation about what an authentic version of Islam would look like in Xinjiang across the various activists. So I think it's important to remember that any religion can be interpreted in either negative or positive ways. For the rest of the non-religious questions, those of you who have seen my many tweets on Xinjiang will probably have a better idea about the events that have happened or the things that have been uncovered about the wider narrative that warrant some of these questions. I do plan to turn those tweets and documents and clips into a video here eventually, and that will give you guys here on YouTube or on the podcast side a little bit more context. Carl Zha, the host of Silk and Steel podcast, also interviewed Aslan afterwards, and he's already uploaded his video. I haven't seen the whole interview yet, but Carl takes an equally respectful approach, but he really wanted to drill down on some specifics, particularly on the situation with Aslan's father-in-law who was detained. I'll drop a link down in the description to Carl's video as well. He's well worth the follow, especially over on Twitter, where he dives pretty deep into Xinjiang's history and culture. I will, of course, also put Aslan's details down in the description so you know where to follow him if you'd like to, and you can find out a little bit more about his work. But it's important to note that it really says a lot that he was willing to put himself out there and come on my show, and that's something I think everybody should really appreciate about him. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Okay, welcome to the show, Aslan Hidayat. Have I said that correctly? I hope I didn't. Uh, uh... <laughs> yeah, Hidayat. Hidayat. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. You know, um, I reached out to a lot of activists, and you're the first one to accept and come on my show. You know, most folks probably know that my audience comprises of quite a few people who have a little bit of a different opinion on the situation or, or have some skepticism, but you're willing to cross the bridge and cross the sides here to speak directly to anyone and everyone. And for that, I have great respect. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I feel that the what we're going to talk about today um you know it's very easy to do interviews that people are on your side like um you know who support the uyghurs or believe in the plight and i think uh making this bridge um just to have this conversation and to see how to sort of there may be people on the other side who are skeptical they might believe or they might go you know what no it actually is fake so it's good to have this conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that's mm. that's true for any topic, really, is, is mm. for two people to get together with two very different uh, viewpoints. But before we get onto our, our uh, main topic, on a more just personal note, how's everything going on your side in terms of the pandemic situation? I believe you're in Turkey, if I'm not mistaken. Are things starting to get back to normal, or it's still kind of, you know, uh, some restrictions on travel or anything like that? Um, life is pretty much back to normal in Turkey, and I think technically it shouldn't be because Turkey is not a country where it can sort of take care of its people economically and they kind of have to get back to work. People do oh. have to wear masks, but for example, I, I work um, in Bahrain mm -hmm. and restaurants and bars and all these places are still closed. Right. Um, and even getting in back into Bahrain, you got to get have COVID tests, whereas that never really happened in Turkey. So um, th there is talk of a second wave, just like every every other country uh, that's right. coming. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that, because the people are really suffering economically here. 
Uh, yeah, 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 it's 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 tough. I mean, here it's starting to get a little bit back to normal. I'm I'm he- I'm heading to Tibet uh, the day after tomorrow, mm. and before I go, I have to do a I had to do one of those COVID tests, also one of the swabs down the throat. A mm. uh, little bit uncomfortable, better better than the ones they put in the nose. I've seen those um, ones, and they go pretty far up there. Yeah. But the um, uh, Shenzhen here, where I am, they have a few new cases, so I'm almost worried before my flight that they'll say, "Oh, okay, sorry guys, you can't go out anymore." But we'll see how it goes. But yeah. um, moving on to our main topic. Um, uh, uh, before we, we jump in, I think it's important uh, just as a point of clarification so our audience doesn't get confused. Um, when I'm referring to uh, the region we're talking about as Xinjiang, you will often refer to it as East Turkestan. And that's fine. Yeah. I don't want to cause too much conflict over this. Too, yeah. I wanted to clarify it just in case our audience gets confused. Um, we can get a little bit into the definition of this uh, more later on, but I'd like to start with something a little bit more um, uh, constructive. So uh, I want to start with saying that one thing I really appreciate about you is that unlike uh, many other activists talking about Xinjiang, although I, I don't believe you were born there, at least you've been there many times. You've been to Xinjiang as a child many times, correct? Yes. So um, so I'm 33 years old this year. So since I was born, uh, my mom would take me there every three and four years. And we would literally stay there four, five, six months each time. Oh. Um, and eventually I married from there. And the last time I was there was uh, the end of 2014. Uh, after that, I I didn't feel comfortable going there. I, I could have gone there up until, say, pre-2017, like just before 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I didn't feel, because w- what I saw, what I was experiencing, I didn't feel that, you know, I can go there as a foreigner. I've got an Australian passport. But it didn't feel good to go there and, you know, have fun while right, right. while people are suffering. So I thought, you know what, I better, you know, stay away. And but I, I you know, it, it wasn't right for me to go. That's what I felt. So okay. I made the decision. Right. It's not that I couldn't go, but I just didn't want to go. It didn't feel right to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got it. I got it. So do you still have um, a connection to Xinjiang in terms of, uh, I, well, I guess your wife obviously isn't there now, but does she still have siblings there or um, family? Like what's your uh, current connection with, uh, with Xinjiang? Yeah, so, yeah, myself, I have uh, aunts and uncles still there. I have mm-hmm. pretty much all my cousins still there and my wife's side. Uh, my wife's side. So... Uh, upon the birth of my um, first daughter, my mother-in-law came. And since then, she hasn't been able to go back. And uh, in, at, on on the birth of my second daughter, uh, my father-in-law was taken into the camps uh, mm-hmm. the very next day, on November 2nd, uh, 2018. And he pretty much, we had no connection with him for 10 months. Yeah, and he's um, a famous star, right? He's quite a famous... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if you literally type in Google or YouTube his name, Adil Mijit, A-D-I-L space M-I-J-I-T, he's a very famous actor. He actually studied at the Shiji Shoyan, which is um, like an acting school in Beijing. Um, and he told me he studied in, in the same building with Peng Liyuan, which is Xi Jinping's wife, because right. in the mid-80s, the Conservatorium of Music in Beijing and the Drama Academy was in one building. Um, and yeah, so he's very well known. He worked at the Xinjiang Opera Theatre uh, troupe for more than 30 years. And just before he was sent to the camps, he was suspended from work. Um, he's, he's out of the camps now, but he is not able to go back to work and is doing uh, other types of business at the moment. Okay. All right. I got it. Okay. So um, that's a pretty, pretty important connection. And then yeah. siblings, your, your wife has siblings in uh, Xinjiang or they're all? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, of- yeah. So my wife has one brother. Um, he came, he's in Turkey right now. He's studying in university. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So now you, of course, now are the general secretary of the uh, Uyghur Revival Association. Um, yeah. And, and you're one of the biggest overseas Uyghur voices in the English community, at least, for information yeah. about Xinjiang. Um, you've been featured on multiple international media outlets. Have I think you're you're at like sixty thousand followers on Facebook, thirty thousand on tw- uh, Twitter. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you got started with your activism and um, jump right into kind of what sure. was, what's going on? Sure. What's going on? Also, yeah, yeah. Um, so my activism started in two thousand and nine, July fifth. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't 
publicly active like you wouldn't be able to see my face i would go to pro like so since the the urumqi riots slash massacre slash protest you know depending on what side you're from you're going to label it differently so yeah. after that uh, my activism started and um we started a small organization in sydney australia uh, but again it, it's not to the level that i'm doing it now where it's like uh, i'm always on showing my face um and then uh not too long after that the the what what had happened was my family uh, in East Turkestan were approached by Chinese authorities and that and, and they knew you know uh, I was attending a protest here and doing a little bit there and straight away um, I kind of went back into my shell mm -hmm. um, but then I, I was doing things on the side for example I would be translating for refugees that came in um, I would be doing uh, little bits and pieces here making videos and things like this or um, making presentations and giving presentations like this but it really wasn't until the start of the concentration camps and definitely upon the um the the arrest of my father-in-law that we went public and now you see my face and i i use my real name and right. uh, you see this so uh talk is turkestan has about seventy thousand uh followers now and uh Twitter on my personal Twitter, close to thirty thousand, and yeah, just uh, advocating, um, doing my best to try and. I mean, there is a lot of fake news. I mean, I've also made the mistake of uh, sharing some uh, wrong information due to my inexperience on things, and I'll be uh, happy to admit that. And yeah, so I guess that's where some uh, skepticism comes because a lot of the, a lot of the things that come out of there seems really unbelievable, and we see other oppressed Muslims around the world, for example, uh, the Palestinians, uh, which which China supports. Um, and we, we would be glad if we had what the Palestinians were going through because uh, the Palestinians can still practice their religion freely, uh, you know, have the headscarf, have the beard, pray, read Arabic, learn Arabic, give their children Muslim names, that women aren't forced to marry Israeli soldiers, for example. So, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah but, um, but but I myself, uh, I'm I'm a qualified music teacher, uh, but I currently teach uh, English uh, in the Middle East. So yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So I mean, in in regard to kind of honing on some some of the skepticism stuff, one of the things that some skeptics will talk about, and I'm wondering if you can kind of reconcile this also, mm -hmm. is that for for quite a long time there's always been kind of policies in place for ethnic minorities, not just Uyghurs, but um, in general, in terms of favorable entry to top universities or not being subjected to the one child policy. Um, what are what are your thoughts on that? Because uh, from a policy point of view, it seems like ethnic minorities, regardless of Uyghur or or anybody else for that matter, are were at least uh, fully supported. So, what are your thoughts around around that? So, here I want to talk about my experience and and the people that I've interviewed. And even though those policies look like that on paper, mm -hmm. when I speak to say university students or uh, the students that were going into universities, apparently this did not exist. Now, I didn't study in China. I didn't experience this myself. But from what I get from them, from the testimony that they've given me, it was like when it came to jobs, when it came to university placement, uh, this was apparently not the case. This is what they told me. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, it, yeah, it, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so for, for me, I mean, here in China, um, I've been on kind of on the lookout for this stuff. And I know uh, some of my wife's friends there are like uh, kind of a mix, they're part uh, ethnic minority, and they try really hard to get the ethnic minority status on their ID card for those entry situations. But again, I mean, you may have spoken to some people who have uh, a different perspective on the situation or from specific uh, ethnic groups. And can I guess I, you're. you're can yeah, I sorry, add go ahead. yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Uyghurs were telling me that if they had the option of putting the word Han on their ID card, they would have. That that's what that's what they were telling me. Really? Because cause, cause they felt that the word Uyghur, because uh even simply just traveling, uh not just that you're Uyghur, if you had like Xinjiang on your, you know, on your ID card, or you had Xinjiang plates, um, and, and even Han Chinese were stopped because they had Xinjiang car plates. Um, uh, you know, re registering at hotels, 
Um, many of us tell them that, that they would register their hotel name or if they were buying a house in the, on the eastern side of China, they would register it under a Chinese friend's name or a Chinese company. Um, yeah, this is what they were telling me. Yeah, I think for in terms of travel, uh, uh, that is absolutely true. Um, I think, you know, the response um, after what happened uh, was kind of a catch-all. So uh, uh, a good friend of mine, um, a woman, she's a Uyghur in her 50s. And uh, when she travels, that's absolutely true. She has to go through extra checks or sometimes the police will come and check on check on her and say, OK, what are you do? What are you doing here? What's your business here? And stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it's it's definitely um, a kind of racial profiling issue. I think um, I mean, I don't mean this to be what about isms. There are a lot of countries that suffer with this uh, racial profiling, for example, somewhere in the U.S. manifests itself in a much worse way where people are potentially shot or, uh, you know, there's physical violence. Now, you're, it, it, of course, you're saying that that's what's happening also. But in terms of, I think it's important for me to add some balance to, to note that that is absolutely true. Uh, when Uyghurs travel, uh, they oftentimes have their documents checked quite a, uh, quite a bit more. But I'm, I'm actually wondering, what are your thoughts on um, the, um, the, the terrorist attacks in, in Xinjiang before the, these wider crackdowns uh, by the Chinese government? Uh, so there, I don't like to get into conspiracy theories, but uh, they have said that uh, there is a story that the these people were spurred on, or that the you, you know the classic nine eleven was done by the U.S. government sort of thing. I I would I wouldn't want to get into that, but there is this narrative out there. Number two, uh, there are people out there. So let's just say. There are people out there throughout their lives, ever since they were children, and, and I'm not, and I'm not condoning the the attack on innocence. I believe mm -hmm. it's wrong. Uh, innocent people on the street should not be killed for whatever reason. So these right. people, uh, if they are Uyghur, I'm not. At the end of the day, whether these people were independently interviewed or not, I'm not really sure. I don't. I don't even know the names, mm -hmm. but these people. What were them? What what was their mental state? Who were these people? Um, so imagine there are some people that I've interviewed. Their whole families have been wiped out: mum, dad, brother, sisters, and they are the lone person. So, and they might have been radicalized, or they brought into that sort of Islamic extremism, and they went out and did what they did. That could be an issue. At the same time, these are individuals that committed murder or terrorism, and therefore. A whole population of people shouldn't be shouldn't be punished for it. So, for example, right. there are terrorist attacks in America, France, Australia, all over the world. But you don't see those governments locking up the whole into or ten percent or five percent or one percent of the Muslim populations there. So, I would treat those as that those attacks happened, okay? But mm -hmm. those people need to be punished. And yeah, that, that's how I would look at it. So, for example, someone like that, that there are people, um, there are people in the camps uh, that I that I know, and I know these people. They haven't even prayed a day in their life. If you ask them what Islam was, like the basic principles, they wouldn't even be able to answer you. So, to blame this on the religion, or to blame it on the whole people, is wrong because. As I mentioned, my father-in-law, an actor. You've got university deans, deans of universities, doctors, um, even some Uyghur communists. I mean, Nur Bekri, you know, um, the, the highest ranking Uyghur official within the CCP, even he's in prison. But obviously he's on tax evasion or whatever charges. But And we believe that these charges are made up. And, um, yeah, so, yes, terrorist attacks uh, happened. And we, I condemn those, everyone in their right mind, but we shouldn't say terrorism has no color, creed. Um, you, you know where I'm going with this. No religion. Right, right, right. You know, it's yeah. killing. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, I, I guess the one thing, though, that paints this as more of just an, an issue with individuals is if we look at what's happening more globally. So, mm -hmm. and, and on that note, in terms of um, Uyghurs traveling to places like Syria to fight alongside ISIS, mm -hmm. I, I just want to know, what are your thoughts on that? Why, what's happening there? Um, in in Because that, that definitely uh, paints the idea that this is actually a, wi a more widespread issue than an issue of individual people uh, kind of acting out. 
Yeah. So the issue here is that uh, Uyghur imams, I'm talking uh, Sunni Orthodox mainstream Uyghur imams, uh, scholars have been locked up by the Chinese government. And so the current Uyghur imams that are there giving sermons and speeches, um, they don't, it's 90% propaganda, CCP propaganda, and 10%. So, so it's like a Chinese version of Islam. And so a lot of Uyghurs will not listen to those imams. The mainstream uh, truth-speaking imams are either locked up or have been executed. So these people uh, that went over to Syria will grab the religious text, read it, and misinterpret it. Because there are many verses in the Quran that if you read, you can misinterpret very easily um, because, uh, and I'll tell you, for example, uh, verses in Surah Anfal, what, 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 I'm not going to sugarcoat the religion of Islam. Uh, in the right context, there is means for defending yourself in the right context. Um, and th this could be taking up arms as well. But these verses have been misinterpreted. And... If these people really wanted to, say, fight against oppression, there's no need to go to Syria because, you know, uh, the CCP are oppressing themselves. So I believe uh, the reason why that these people actually went is because, again, I'm going to get into a bit of a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. is that uh, these people were really egged on, you know, as Uyghurs and especially m m my wife's family. Right, they spent thousands of dollars just to get a passport. It's very difficult uh, for Uyghurs. Uh, you need the right connections. You need to be in the right city. Mm -hmm. uh, the people from the south, Hotan, Kashgar, it's pretty much impossible. You've got to register yourself into Urumqi or another uh, city in China. What happened was, and you can look this up, especially when I was there, between 2013 and 2016, or I believe it started in 2012, the Chinese passport was selling for the right price, its original price, which is around 30 US dollars or 40 US dollars. It's uh, which, uh, three, 400 Chinese yuan. And people were literally, and this is what, this is what they told me, they, they were um, pretty much, you know, they were almost ordered to come and get their passports. And, and the passports that these people were handing them to, normally they would be locked up for their religious activities and i'm talking like simply reading quran having a beard having a headscarf and all of these people suddenly left on mass and during that time and, and it was on news it was on radio free asia it was on all, all over the news how how easily it is to now get a passport something like 30 40 50 us dollars so easy and we we're like you know what china's really changing but what happened the people that actually came out were were many of them you know did i don't know the statistics but a lot mm -hmm. of them did end up in uh, those war zones. And later we realized, ha, huh, this was because for the longest time you speak to, I mean, I don't know if you've interviewed Uyghurs, but every Uyghur that I spoke to, they, on average, they spent anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000 US dollars just to get one passport, plus right. having to uh, be registered in Urumqi. So, okay. and, and we were like, how... Where, why was that shift? And suddenly you had like, I don't know what the exact numbers were. According to um, Chinese statistics, they said anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 Uyghurs. Um, yeah. And so these people are, these people are brainwashed. And, and I've spoken to some people in Turkey who are on the verge of going to Syria. And I stopped mm -hmm. them. I convinced them. And, and, and I'm telling you right now, uh, Dan, they had no idea what Islam was and what it taught. These people had no idea. They were just there to, you know, they, had, they were on something so, else. Yeah. So, I mean, this sounds like it's a, uh, I mean, you're mentioning there's people even from Turkey who uh, 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 assuming, <clears throat> assumingly have access to the Quran and its full nature, um, who are misled also, because uh, obviously ISIS, uh, they're uh, recruiting tens of thousands of people from around the world. Um, yeah. You know, you've got people from Indonesia going also. You've got Uyghurs from Kazakhstan who are also going. Um, so, it, it, I mean, even if you want to say, okay, China's specific problem is 
because they are pushing them even more in that direction. Okay, that's fine. But now we, we've got an issue where even without the CCP element, uh, we still have this issue. So my question for you would be, what what would you do if you had this mass problem, um, you know, with uh, people being radicalized? So I Indonesia and Kazakhstan, they also have re-education programs. Mm -hmm. America takes a little bit of a different approach. They uh, they just kill them. They do airstrikes on them. Uh, the, the From 2003, the last big publicized one was in 2018 when they basically just blew up a, a site full of uh, Uyghurs from uh, from from China, obviously other places um, uh, uh, like uh, England, they try to block them from even coming back to the country. Like uh, uh, Shamima Begum, I think her name was. They they wanted to revoke her British citizenship. Um, obviously, three judges ended up ruling that she would be permitted to to, to return to challenge it. But um, how 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 do you feel these other countries are doing in the response? And what would you do differently if all of a sudden you had? thousands of, 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 of Uyghurs or Muslims in general traveling to Syria, would you set up programs? Would you take, would you take the incarceration route? Uh, or would you, uh, you know, what, 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 what would your solution be basically? Yeah. So I totally agree with you uh, on the part of the, of the US and um, I've experienced a racial profiling in Australia as well. Uh, traveling because I would travel to and fro from Australia and, you know, I had this beard and it definitely exists. And, um, and, and I see the argument that, well the, well, the U.S. has bombed a bunch of Muslim countries back into the Stone Age, so who are they to speak? And I totally agree with that. Um, so the first thing I would have is actually freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, people, you know, I, I've seen uh, interviews on CG thing. well, there is no uh, repression of religion, and we say there is because I've interviewed people that have gone into prison uh, for simply teaching their children uh, the Qur'an at home. So if if they let if they let people practice freely and if they let the knowledge you know imams and the scholars out and not in prison and they taught the true Islam you know we can educate ourselves um, and 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 the one and even even within an educated you know uh, a a religion that's taught uh, truthfully. You're still going to have extremists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and if a real education program with no torture, uh, you know the, the the stories that we hear from the Western media, if the, if that if the torture and all these things did not exist, um, def definitely uh, have an ex accelerated. You, you, you know the education program that China says it has on paper mm -hmm. on the media. Uh, that we do not buy, if that really existed, sure, go for it. Go for that really extremist type because I've I've spoken to really extreme people myself and right. that is a need. But my father my father in law was not an extremist. He right. worked for the CCP. He gave his life 30, 35 years. Right. Why was he in there for 10 months? No crime, no nothing to this day. Um and, and he came out a good 30 kilos lighter. Um, and to this day, he he left the camp about eleven months ago, mm -hmm. and he still cannot talk to us over the phone. Right. He still he has no passport. He has money, I, I, and and I'm telling you this. I, I don't want to get into Western media and Chinese leak files, and I don't want to get into that. But right. my story: Why doesn't my father-in-law have a passport? His wife is here. His granddaughters are here. His daughter and son are here. We live in one house. Why can't he visit? You know, right. you know, and, and and no one can say, Arslan, you're lying here because this is my story. And he does not have a passport. And that is fact. No one can lie about that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. no, it does sound like uh, that's, yeah. Um, so I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a bit, but it, yeah. kind of honing in on this situation about um, there are extremist problem, extremism yeah. problems, even in countries that don't have the CCP model. Um, yeah. you know, and, and so this ties into a little bit of a personal curiosity I have about Islam. Um, you know, for years I've listened to folks like Mehdi Hassan and Muhammad Hajib speak about Islam and debates, and I feel like it's probably very misunderstood by the West. But the one thing that really caught my attention is with, it was in your interview on the Thinking Muslim podcast, you mentioned that there is no really true Muslim country in the world in, in terms yeah. of practicing Sharia law. So what I was wondering is if, if, if that's what you have hopes that uh, Xinjiang or East Turkestan could eventually become, 
uh, once it's recognized as independent, is a truly Muslim country. And so if so, what is a truly Muslim country? What would they have to be doing differently that other Muslim countries around the world aren't doing right now in order to get your kind of seal of saying, okay, this is a truly Muslim country? Do you know what I mean? So I would say uh, the definition, there, there's a difference between Muslim or Islamic country and Muslim majority countries. So there are 50 odd Muslim countries that are Muslim. I'm not going to, I don't like to use the word Muslim or Islamic country. So for example, say Turkey is a Muslim majority country. Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia is a Muslim majority country. Bahrain, Qatar, UAE. For you to be an Islamic country, you would need to apply uh, the the Sharia or the Quran um, in all, if not most, of your situation. So, for example, drinking is allowed in the UAE. Clubbing is allowed in the. You know what I mean. So right. things that are so uh, uh, adultery is uh, as, as long as you are not for, fornicating in front of people is is allowed in a lot of these so-called uh, in, in Muslim in Muslim majority countries. Now, the vision that I have, I'm not going to talk about others, the vision that I have from, for East Turkestan is that we, we become, and many Uyghurs disagree with me on this, that we become a de democratic, secular nation where regardless of whether you're Muslim, non-Muslim, practicing, non-Christian, gay, lesbian, straight, that everyone, you know, lives freely. That's my vision, personally. Um, so now in terms of the gay, cause I know that at Brunei, um, they tried to pass a law, uh, in terms of making homosexuality punishable by death and they backed off of it afterwards. But I mean, so could it, it, it would, so the LGBTQ community would be supported in your version of East Turkestan, or it's not really compatible with Sharia law and there would have to be some sort of, uh, a punishment for that or reform or something. Because I, I know you mentioned that the, the gay community would be treated well too, but I'm looking at what some of the other countries that aspire to follow Sharia law do, and as far as they're concerned, that's outlawed. That's a punishable crime. Definitely. So uh, as I mentioned again, I don't, uh, I don't envision because the reality of the political framework in the world today is that for us to have an independent state, we would need to follow the current political situation and. And we would, and to be honest, in that region, nobody wants an Islamic state. Nobody wants a Turkic, you know, this sort of Turkey in Central Asia. So I'm, I'm talking about reality wise that I, I want a democratic secular nation. But as you mentioned, um, the actions. So, for example, I live, I work in a Muslim majority country that claims to be following the, the Sharia. And Gay people are living there freely as long as they are not uh, doing their actions in the public. Um, and, and 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 I know of gay people that live in Muslim majority countries. They live together, but they don't show their, their you know PDAs. That they don't do that um, on the street, and they're fine. Uh, but I don't know how. I don't know what you mean by that, though. Yeah. Uh, in, in regards to when it comes to Sharia, so, uh, so in your, for, from your point of view, also, yeah, so or not punishable. Oh, I'm not yeah. sure that would that would be left to the judge. I have no judgment on this because I'm not an expert in Sharia law. There is no book of Sharia law. Uh, you, you, uh, in Islam, we have the Holy Quran and we have the Hadith, which is the actions and the sayings of the Prophet, and then you have judges that would interpret those verses and actions of the Prophet to give their judgments and I'm not an expert in that. So whether or not okay. gay people from, from your, be from your, from your, from your, I'm so not from, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so from your point of view though, um, uh, gay people could still be safe as long as they kept it private and they didn't publicize that they were gay, but also a judge uh, who was following Sharia law potentially could um, it, 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 deem it as a uh, criminal uh, action, but that's not something that you could really say yourself because it would have to be left up to a judge in uh, charge of such a um, Islamic uh, region. It exactly, exactly, and um, and going back to there are no real Muslim countries. If they really were Muslim countries, then we would have at least one Muslim country uh, stand up 
you know, and, you know, say words of condemn, not just words of condemnation, like at least do what the US is doing, come up with a Uyghur human rights bill, um, something similar to that to sanction Chinese officials. And we haven't seen one. So, yeah. It's very yeah, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? I mean, we have uh, 54 countries that have visited and they've uh, uh, mostly Muslim countries and they've said that they they uh, <clears throat> appreciate what China is doing and they say yeah. that they are adhering to uh, human rights uh, kind of things like that. But in the West, and this is where we, we get some of the skepticism mm -hmm. from our side also, the only thing that's published in the news finally is saying that 24 countries condemn China at the UN for their actions in Xinjiang. And they completely leave out, the, all the mainstream media completely leaves out that 54 countries, mostly Muslim countries, actually support China and say, this is a real issue. We've gone, we visited, and we think they're doing the right thing. But for you, um, what, what's your perspective on that? Like, why are they, um, uh, why, why are they doing this? All right, would you would you believe me if so? For example, China supports the Palestinians against Israel, right? I, I'm not very familiar with the topic. But yes, yeah. but so so China publicly supports the oppression of the Palestinians against Israel, and this is you can just look it up in exactly mm -hmm. in in okay. a second. Um, and yet, these 54 countries that you mention, uh, most of them are good 90, 95 percent don't support the Palestinians. And we've seen that recently as well. So you have these uh, majority Muslim countries, uh, most of them Arab countries as well. They don't even support their own Arabs, Palestinians, mm -hmm. Yemenis. Um, and what would you expect? You've got people all the way in China uh, being oppressed. You know, So if they're not supporting their own Arabs, then what hope do we have? We don't even have Turkey, who we are ethnically linked with, we are religious, religiously linked with, and they are, you know, what we say, in bed with China as well. So th these states, a lot of these 54 nations are second, third world countries. Uh, they need China's aid. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this, this notion of, you know, like uh, the Muslims are united like Europe. This, this doesn't exist. The, the Muslims themselves are, are very divided uh, amongst themselves as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, t uh, there's there's an explanation there that people should think about and some of the stuff that you should look up. I mean, it's not only them, uh, the, 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 um, the the president of the um, UN counter counterterrorism at the UN. He also um, was uh, speaking about visiting here and seeing everything that was going on and kind of uh, uh, thought what China was doing was good. But it's the same kind of thing. You don't hear that kind of uh, uh, a perspective. But I want to uh, uh, kind of change because I'm, I'm really particularly interested in what, like what is a, a uh, how should because one of your one of your things you talk about is that uh, Muslims here are not allowed to practice uh, Islam in, in the kind of they're practicing it in a in a CCP version, uh, you know, a Chinese sanctioned version, 90 percent uh, Chinese uh, uh, version of Islam and then 10 percent the real stuff. So I want to ask a question from a theoretical or a few questions from a theoretical point of view. If you were part of the leadership in a new East Turkestan, um, I'm wondering what you do things about things like these, because as, as you know, China, like many other countries, uh, ban uh, full face coverings for uh, women. So obviously, um, uh, times have changed now. Now everybody's covering their face because of the pandemic. Yeah. But th th these laws were uh, undeniably, they were designed to, to prevent Muslim uh, women from wearing full face veils, just like everywhere else in the world where they've made these laws. And um, as I understand, there is a debate amongst Muslim scholars in terms of whether Muslim women should be obligated or not to wear a full face veil. So, of course, I can already imagine that in your version of East Turkestan, it wouldn't be banned, but would women be required to wear it? So um, I'm going to answer this question. And I just want to I wanted to add something with the how you how you mentioned the Muslim. A lot of the Muslim majority, kind of, they visited the area uh, <laughs> uh, whenever countries are invited to visit. Mm -hmm. They and and I'm sure you've seen this. Um, you know, when journalists visit as well, uh, they are not they are not independent. Uh, when they go to try and interview people, they are stopped. Uh, their documentaries that they set out to do end up being about how they were followed half the time. And you have to give mm -hmm. me credit on that. Um, and China will not to this day allow independent investigation. Uh, you've seen reporters where they enter in these schools and they are put on stage tours. So I have to highlight that. Number two, uh, back into this question, uh, people should be free to wear whatever they want 
as long as they are not uh, inappropriately exposing themselves, like their genitalia or whatever. So uh, if I was in the leadership of East Turkestan, if you want to cover your face, cover your face. If you don't want to cover, if you want to wear a mini skirt, wear a mini skirt. If you want to wear long dress, long dress. If you want to have a bead, wear a bead. If you don't, you don't. So I would not, mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, it's your business what, what you want to wear. That, that 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 would right, be right, right. Like I'm saying, I I don't call for an Islamic state for East Turkestan. I'm um I'm calling for a democratic secular nation where people can practice and live however they want, as long as they are not harming others. You know. Now, so so one one thing you mentioned though earlier was that you a point of contention was that uh, in the UAE and other places um, they are they they drink there and that's not uh, that's not uh, permitted in Islam. That's not permitted in uh, Sharia mm -hmm. law. And um, now, obviously, in in um, in uh, Xinjiang, East Turkestan, you know, the Uyghurs and others have been drinking since the fourth century BC, you know, making grape wine and, and things like that. So, yeah. but because you mentioned that as a point of contention with UAE, would uh, in our theoretical version, where you're in the leadership of uh, East Turkestan, would would drinking be banned? So, as I mentioned. However, people want to live like that, that. That's how I would uh, envision. So we we are not the UAE. So for example, I'm not in the UAE, but for example, in Bahrain, they drink, but they're not allowed to drink publicly, and and that's even on, in a lot of Western countries as well. So I would imagine public drinking wouldn't be allowed, but um, as I mentioned, we'd be a democratic secular state in my vision. Mm -hmm. um, again, many Uyghurs hate me on this, but you would be able to live however you want. You want to drink, you don't want to drink, it's up to you. Um, we wouldn't, we say that the, Chi the, the Chinese regime forces people to drink and that they force people to eat during the month of Ramadan. And if the month of Ramadan came, you want to fast, you fast. You don't want to fast, you don't fast. This, you know, you live um, freely. That That's what I would say. You want to go to mosque, you want to go to a church, you want to... You know, you want to worship the devil? It's up to you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, um, you know, there, there seems to be a theme though where it's uh, it's more or less um, do what you want. You can drink uh, you, you, if you if you're if you're gay, that's fine, but just do it in private. Don't yeah. uh, like so. Th there still needs to be a kind of a uh, um, that is a kind of suppression also, though, isn't it? I mean, maybe with the drinking, there's plenty of countries that ban uh, public drinking, but the idea that uh, people wouldn't be allowed to be openly gay. Um, is it just too conflicting no, with no, uh, no, no? With, I yeah. personally, I personally wouldn't like this. I, I mentioned that about say a lot of the Muslim majority countries, you wouldn't be able to publicly do that. Uh, as I me I'll mention again, in democratic mm -hmm. secular society, uh, the thing is, Uyghurs culturally and even, even the even, uh, even the gay people, uh, within Uyghur culture. They, they wouldn't do that publicly anyway because it's a cultural thing. So mm -hmm. I guess I would say they wouldn't be punished for it if they did. Okay. So, for example, e e even, even heterosexuals, even Uyghur heterosexuals holding hands in public will be, it's, it's frowned upon, you know, and, and, okay. and you could be married, you could be husband and wife, and that would be like kissing in public. The, um, the, our culture is so, I know, I know a lot of people who have never practiced a day of Islam in their life. Mm -hmm. But because Islam is infused in the culture, they wouldn't even be doing those things in public. But I guess what you're talking about, would it be punished in the vision that I have for East Turkestan? No, they wouldn't be punished. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, it, now, obviously, I mean, you're talking about what it, what a Uyghur culture is like, um, but, uh, you know, uh, that area is made up of quite a few other kind of other ethnic minorities, uh, the Han Chinese also. So obviously the Han Chinese population dropped a bit. 1980, they made up 40% of the population. The most recent census puts them at 30, 36%. Um, but so in your version, would these other people, would they, uh, they'd be free to practice their religion? They would be... Um, uh, they would free to have their own beliefs, their uh, your own religions, but ultimately the region would be ruled under Sharia law. So they would they would be allowed to stay as long as they're kind of following Sharia law. Uh, Dan, I've been constantly saying my vision. Uh, eventually, what happens to what? Like, what, if my vision of the state doesn't come to fruition, I don't know what sort because. It, even the word Sharia law is a very blanket statement because mm, okay. 
are, are you talking about ISIS? Are you talking about Saudi Arabia? Are you talking about, Tur I mean, Turkey doesn't say, but you know, what well, what sort of Islamic state, I mean, you, you know what I mean? So in my yeah. version, whoever live there, they can practice, they can worship whoever they want. As to what sort of state will end up happening, Will it be a theocracy? Will it be an autocracy? Will it be an oppressive regime again? Because we know that Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, when they first became independent, they, they were really oppressive against religions as well. Mm -hmm. So, and I could, let's just say we were independent. I could be talking on the show with you about how oppressive the Uyghur leaders are in, in, in an independent East Turkey. You know what I mean? So whoever is living there, Will be free to practice whatever they want as right, long as right. it doesn't call for violence. This, this. So I'm not. Again, I have to read. I'm not calling for Sharia or Islamic State or anything like this. So yeah, the reason I'm um, I'm kind of uh, why am I so, interested? Sorry, sorry, can I add something there? Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I guess the the questions that are coming. I, I, I guess this is what uh, probably the people in China or the sort of the the news that's coming from Chinese state media. Maybe that's that they think all of us want an Islamic state. And you know what? A lot of the people that I meet, mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of hate for calling this. It, I mean, it's true. I got to give it to you, but th there are voices out there like mine that that that, that don't call for an Islamic state at all, and we we just want people to live freely. Like we 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 literally, I would kind of liken it to a Bosnia. You know mm -hmm. the setup of Bosnia right now. That yeah. that would be East Turkestan. Okay. So the, the reason I'm, I'm so I, I just want to clarify though um, I never heard anything about uh, people wanting an Islamic state or Sharia law or anything like that uh, beforehand. The reason my interest was piqued in that and, and why I was kind of honing in on that was because yeah. of your interview on the Thinking Muslim, where you talked about there was no true Muslim country and that yeah. um, in terms of practicing Sharia law. So I was just trying to kind of figure out what your definition of that was. Um, but uh, that that's where it's coming from. So this is not. I think you're right in terms of a lot of people in the west that's the thing that you hear that's the mm. boogeyman for everybody in yeah. the in, in in that's how uh muslims were villainized after 9 11 they were always talking about sharia law and nobody probably nobody really understood what it was yeah. and as long as you looked muslim even if you were brown like me growing up in north america all of a sudden yeah. you were treated really suspiciously mm. so i think there's a lot of uh, ignorance around what sharia law is i think that the, the, the literal translation is the clear well-trodden path to water um, and then within the Muslim community, I think there's a lot of debate about um, uh, what it actually means. And it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of items in there that are up for interpretation. But that's why I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. It ties into a personal curiosity yeah. I have with, uh, 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 with, um, with that. Uh, so I, I want to just to, and, and when I ask these questions, some of these questions might sound ignorant in terms of well isn't this what well, sharia fine. law means and and it, it and and that i think it's important to ask these because maybe a lot of other people have the same kind of uh ideas about well hold on a second doesn't that mean this is going to happen um so with that i i just want to kind of uh f there was one other thing i was personally curious about because we hear about in muslim countries with um you know with uh, men having you know multiple brides or you know children children being married uh, or arranged marriages uh, would this uh, do you think that because obviously i think a lot of these things are obviously banned in 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 uh, xinjiang east turkestan under chinese rule would those things be okay also uh, in terms of exactly what you said people living like how they want so if they believe that part of sharia law if that's in there again uh, excuse my ignorance if it's not in terms of a man taking multiple wives or uh, arranged marriages, would that be okay if that's what the, the parents wanted to do, for example, in uh, East Turkestan? Okay, so we have to differentiate between an arranged marriage and a forced marriage. Mm -hmm. Forced marriages are not allowed. And arranged marriages, for example, I have a daughter mm -hmm. and uh, you know someone we know has a son. And mm -hmm. we say, you know what, my daughter, you know, Fulan, I mean, you know, Dave, you know, uh, Ahmed, you know, he's grown up. He's just finished his law degree. Um, would you guys like to, would you like us to set up a meet and greet? And they would hash it over. And, um, and, and you know, you know, in Islam, we've got to be quite, we've got to be clear. I mean, th there is no, there is no touching. There is no fornication before, you know, sex before, we, you know, what we, we are conservative people. And it, mm -hmm. this is exactly in Christianity, in Judaism. So there's nothing different here. So they could meet as many times as, uh, as they liked, as long as there was, you know, a third person there. They don't have to like be right there, but just watching over them. And if my daughter and the son wanted, 
they would get married. This is an arranged marriage, and uh, I believe this ha this happens in many cultures, regardless of religion. Number two, uh, polygamous or uh, polygynous marriages, where the male gets two, three, four wives. And I would say, you know, in 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 a sort of Western context, you know, I don't know what the statistics are, but before you actually get married, you actually go through a lot of partners. Um, mm -hmm. And I would make the argument, for example, hypothetically, if three people, one man, two women, if they all agreed to be in this relationship, why should we stop them? That's all I if these three people, they want to. So, for example, right now, mm -hmm. okay, let, let's, hyper, hypothetically, let's just say I'm a player, okay, I'm married and I have 10 girls on the side, okay, mm -hmm. and if they were all okay with that, like, what's the law? And just because I'm not marrying them. So I'll tell you a story of, of things that happen in a lot of Muslim countries that ban actually polygynous um, relationships is that, mm -hmm. you know, a man will have a wife and who have a second wife and the first wife knows about it and they're living quite normally. So uh, th this guy who was jealous of this man. Okay, sorry, I, got, I lost you there for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. I think the connection stabilized. I'm going to just change the Wi-Fi of that. Were you able to hear the whole I got, story? I got to the point where you, you were saying, um, so there was a, a, somebody who was jealous, uh, reported the couple. Okay. So so, so, so the guy r reports Ahmed because he's got two wives, he's living in two homes, and he's jealous. So he tells this is, the police. This is in uh, uh, Xinjiang, East Turkestan? No, no. Uh, no uh, it, it's, it, the, uh, I'm making up the story, but uh, you hear a lot of these stories in Muslim-majority okay. countries. Okay. So he reports the police. The police do an investigation, and they see that Ahmed really does spend three days in this house and another two days in that house. And they go, well, you know what? This guy does have two wives. So they call Ahmed in. They interrogate him. They go, mm -hmm. Ahmed, we've got video images of you. Admit to your crime. You've got two wives, don't you? And you know this is illegal by our, you know, by our state. And Ahmed goes, the first, the first house I go to, yes, that's my wife. The second house I go to is my mistress, is my girlfriend. And the cops let him go. Oh, okay, okay. But for example, for example, right now in today's society, right? If I'm <laughs> playing five girl, let, let's just say I've got five girlfriends, ten girlfriends. Are the cops going to do anything to me? No, I'm not going to be arrested. I could have twenty, thirty girlfriends. Nothing's going to happen to me. So, so the the what what used to happen was be, be, before back then, right? Yeah. Uh, in in all religions, life back then, or regardless of what, you know, people worship various things, there was no limit to wives. Islam came and said, you know, we're going to limit it to four. But you know what? The best for you is having one. We're the only religion in the world on text, on paper, we, not even Christianity says this, on paper in the Bible, we're the only religion that says, you know what? We advise that you have one wife. Right. Okay. So I we're we're saying is that let's just say let's just say a guy had four wives, five people, and they all knew each other and they all agreed to this relationship. And but in Islam, when it says to take a wife, it, it it's not about sex, because that's the first thing. This man has to provide the the the, the children that that he bears, you know, that, that there are rights of a wife. Whereas right. you wouldn't have that with a mistress or a girlfriend. That's so an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting yeah. perspective. I think, and, and, and yeah. even right now in America, yeah, you know, I've seen television shows, and I'm sure you've have where they have five, six wives living in one house, and and this is broadcast all over U.S. television. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so, you know, and I believe this is democratic. I think yeah. people, if they that's... want, if they want to have two, three, four wives, and they all agree, and they all know what's up, what's stopping them? Yeah, I mean that that's an interesting uh way that you put it and I think yeah. uh the, the there's a lot of this is the issue when people think about something superficially. I mean, I admit I, I personally um I I I don't I don't really support the idea, but you you you've presented a really uh, compelling argument. And I think that's important for people to realize that uh when judging another culture, you know, it happened in it happened in Tibet too. You know, Tibet has a culture of um, you know, when you are when you die, when you pass away, they take your body and they chop it up and they put it in the field for the the vultures to eat. And um, 
they, the, the rest of the world and a lot of Han Chinese also, they were shocked by this. They said these are it's, uh, bar, barbaric on, yeah. on the internet and stuff like that. But they don't understand. I mean, in, in, in Buddhist culture, um, you have no physical attachment to physical objects in this world, including your own body. And when you're done with it, it's just a shell and you're hmm. returning it to the earth. And so what they ended up doing was, um, and I've seen this with Islam too, uh, with different things, is uh, the China ended up censoring things. And also they blocked, uh, the local Tibetan government blocked any more tourists from going to those sites where they do kind of the chop up the bodies because it would have caused a cultural conflict and a misunderstanding. Um, but I think I, I do really appreciate your explanation because it is uh, uh, very, uh, very logical. Um, I want to kind of change gears a bit and kind of come back to this topic of uh, because we're referring to this place, I'm referring to it as Xinjiang, you're referring to it as East Turkestan. So East Turkestan was, uh, of course, first coined by the Russian explorer uh, Timovsky. And but at that time, though, it only referred to the, uh, the uh, Terim Basin uh, that local Uyghurs referred to as uh, uh, Altashar, I believe, the six oasis cities. But outside of that area, it was largely kind of a Buddhist practicing area, particularly between the 10th and 13th century. So my question is, is for your, for your version of East Turkestan, does it include all of what is called Xinjiang today, or is it specifically those areas in the south? So East Turkestan refers to, I mean, my my history all the way back then is not good. Um, mm -hmm. and, and after the show, I can advise some people that you could interview okay. that they are really good with history. So the East Turkestan that we refer to, um, because back then, uh, East Turkestan was, you know, in the first East, East Turkestan uh, Islamic Republic, 1933 to 1934. I, di I don't even think it lasted for a year. There are many arguments as to how long it lasted. And then the one that was set up in the north in Gulja from 1944 to 1949. And so that would encompass uh, 1.8 square, 1.8 million square kilometers, give or take, which, which actually would include not just what we know today as a Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, it would also, um, another 200,000 square meters, where, where it would include Gansu as well. Uh, so that would be the East Turkestan, not, okay. not so much the Al-Tishahar, the, the, the six states as, as you're referring to. Right. Um, yeah. That's, okay. what, yeah, that's what it would en encompass. Um, and you got to really imagine if true autonomy was given in 1955 today there would be no independence movement i mean even up until before these camps were opened people weren't really calling for i mean there are there, there, there are small groups of people that called for independence but not to this level where like where we've realized that because china have you ever seen the movie snowpiercer no i haven't no it's it's a movie where the, uh the world has you know is no longer livable and the last bit of population of the human race is on this long train okay they live on this train the train keeps on going around the world and on the last cabin uh so you and you have you know each of the cabin the, the more you get to the front you get to the elites of society and all the way at the back you've got all the poor people so what you would have to do is after some years the poor people you know, procreate, and then the population gets bigger, and then there's a culling every 10, 20 years, okay? So this is what China has done uh, since its occupation, whether it be during the Cultural Revolution, uh, the Baran Massacre in 1990, Gulja Massacre, the, the Urumqi Riots slash Massacre. So there is every 10 years we see, and now with the concentrate, there's like this 10-year period where there's like, a softening of policy and then hardening, softening of policy and then hardening again. So we believe that without independence, we will never be truly free because, as I mentioned, China China's the second strongest nation in the world. I mean, who wouldn't want to live under such a, such a nation? I know many Uyghurs who were like, you know what, i got a Chinese passport. Why would I want to get citizenship anywhere else? It's because eventually one day, that that passport that that strength is going to mean nothing and again talking from a personal point of view my wife and my mother-in-law's passport ran out two years ago they're chinese citizens they went to the chinese i'm sorry three years ago they went to the chinese embassy they applied for a chinese passport and number one you know you, you know how they say there's no banding of headscarves well m m my wife gave in photos of a headscarf they rejected it and but on the application form, 
you know how they have on a passport application form that that this sort of picture is allowed, that sort of picture isn't allowed. They allowed for a woman to cover her head to as a passport photo, but she had to redo her passport. She had to uncover her head, give that photo, and they gave her a two-year booklet, a travel document, and I've got those papers with me. It says you can only use this once and travel only to Xinjiang so that you can renew your passport there. And obviously, I'm not going to take the risk in 2007, 2018, send my wife to Xinjiang because my because my father-in-law is also, uh, you, know, you know what I mean? So she, her as a Chinese, and we saw other Chinese Han people that live in Istanbul, they were comfortably renewing their passports, no problems asked. And there are many people. And, there, and had, had, so the situation in Turkey was that thousands of Uyghurs were put into this situation. So without a passport, you can't register your kids to school. You can't get a residence permit here. And people will be stopped on the street um, by Turkish police. They've got no papers, straight into deportation center. So, yeah. So do you... Um... Do you feel this could potentially be like retaliation for what you're doing because they're connected to you that they're being because I mean, you're saying that other people are able to go in and, and get their passports without issue. Do you feel that potentially because you're no. taking a stand? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, th 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 this was um, back in 2017 and I wasn't that active number one. And we, we okay. know thousands of people and even their parents, they work for the CCP. And these guys are the most uh, the people that we know. Um, if China reopened its doors right now, they'd be first to fly back. They'd be like, you know, we, we accept Uyghurs, uh, mm -hmm. and these guys are very loyal to the CCP. Even these people couldn't get their passports. Uh, yeah. So it, it had nothing to do with me. Okay. Or, okay. You know. uh, now, uh, on to your point about this kind of a, a softening and then hardening, softening yeah. and hardening, but there was always this campaign to kind of squeeze out uh, Uyghurs and Uyghur culture. How, how would you, how would you going back to my other point though before, how would you reconcile this idea that, that Uyghurs were allowed to have uh, more than one child while Han Chinese were restricted to, restricted to one? Why would they do that if that was always their goal all along? Uh, number one, why should they be restricting the Uyghurs to two children in the first place? Why? Well, yeah, I, the, yeah, the question about family planning is why yeah. should they have family planning for everybody at all anyways? But in the context of having it, why would the, re, re, the, the situation be more relaxed for Uyghurs than it is for Han if there was always this attempt to squeeze them out? Um, I would say, I would say not to cause not to cause more tension than that that needs to be. So for example, the, the, the reason why we have a, an autonomous region by name is so that we don't revolt once again. So when, when the family planning, cause what, in 1980 in, it was introduced and only around 1990 it was implemented and then you had tensions straight away. So I believe it was, it was initially two child, and they were going to take it to one child. But if you look back at what happened at the Bara massacre, that's an example of, you know what, and, and I don't have any proof of this, but I believe their intention was to soften them up to it. You know what, let's just soften up with two children and eventually we'll take it down to one. But they saw that, you know what, these Uyghurs are, you know, then th they're not going to take this lying down. Let's just keep it at two children because what happened in Baden back in 1990 was... A mess, and even as I mentioned, uh, you guys can look at this. I think in 1979 or 1980, the law came in place, and and they gave it a good ten years for the Uyghurs to soften up to it. You so, mean in terms uh, of giving them giving them this extra um, amount just as a, a sign of a, a show? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so, so that it doesn't really, you know, there's no right, 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 right. Anyway. What, what do you what, yeah, what, what do you think? Um, about this, the report uh, that came out from Adrian Zentz in terms of uh, Uyghur women being uh, sterilized. You know, per personally, I found it problematic that uh, he was talking about the gen g supposed genocide of Uyghurs, but didn't uh, at least mention that the overall Uyghur population went up in Xinjiang while the Han po Chinese population went down. But even a bigger um, issue I had was with some of the, the, the testimonies. You know, so for example, the first witness, uh, um, uh, Ter uh, Tersone uh, Z uh, Ziwadun or something like that, 
I have it written here, but I don't think I will be able to say it any better, even if it was in front of me. But, but she was interviewed in February and she said she was never physically abused, uh, but suffered mental abuse in the in the reeducation camps. But now her interview for Adrian Zenz, which was like less, you know, less than six months later uh, uh, for his new piece on sterilization. She said she was injected until she stopped having her period and was kicked repeatedly in the stomach and is now in constant pain. And I've seen this, I've seen this over and over again, where we, we have a massive change in story. And this adds to the skepticism. I, 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 I wonder if you know, why is this happening? This is on the report that everybody's accepting and saying, oh, wow, look at this new bombshell report. So one, the, the obviously, if you're going to look at the overall population growth, um, you know, a lot of the Uyghurs actually do not accept the, the population that the Chinese gives about the Uyghur population. We think it's more, but I, but I think that goes against our case to say we have more of a population. Obviously, you're going to have population growth if you're going to compare from 1970 to 2020. But what Adrian Zenz did was he was comparing uh, between 2016-17 to about 2019-20 based on China's own documents. So, so the sources that he uses are from, you know, the Bureau of Statistics, uh, child planning, uh, various different um, government uh, bodies mm -hmm. in China. So he doesn't use any Western. It's like from China's own websites. Number two, I, I've, first, I've seen Tursunay. I've met Tursunay. She's currently here in Istanbul. Um, yeah, she's in a very bad state. I'm not sure what she – I haven't heard or seen the interview that she gave in February, so I can't judge and compare between the two. It was, her, uh, it was on I BuzzFeed. Really yeah. Honest, yeah. I haven't seen it. I'll watch it later, and um, yeah, I'll tell yeah, you it's, about it's it. A written, it's a written one on BuzzFeed, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. Okay, I yeah. haven't seen that. Okay. And um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've interviewed – a lot myself. I'm not going to talk about who Adrian Zenzin interviewed, but they also give me the same story where they were injected. Uh, that their blood is taken every morning and they're injected at night, or they were in injected in the morning and the blood is taken at night. Um, and there was the case of when I interviewed Zumra Dawood, where she had given some of the food to an older woman, um, and she was punished for that. And when she was beaten, she simply said, "You know, Allah." And then she was beaten even more, like because uh, you would have seen that Islam is treated as a tumor or a disease, and they re and it, it's really true because we had one, we had one man by the name of uh, Olsi uh, Yazelhi. You would have heard of him. Mm -hmm. We have our own differences, but when he was interviewing these people, how candid the Uyghurs were about saying, "I, I no longer believe in Islam." And this is not very normal. Even if a Uyghur did not believe in Islam, to say that it, it, it's not—it's hard for me to uh, to explain. But that's not a normal thing a Uyghur says to no longer believe. It's—it's it's not. I mean, you cannot believe, but right, for right. them to say it in that in that setting, it's yeah. it is really far fetched. But as to are they are they really sterilized or not? I'm not sure because we are getting this from testimony. This this is what they're telling me as well. And and uh, based on the the China's statistics, the birth rate is close to zero. This is what China is giving us in the last three years. Obviously, yeah, you're going to make a 50-year thing, then obviously there will be a difference. Well, yeah, because in the last few years, what we saw, when, when you actually dig into his data, you actually see it's the Han Chinese population going uh, down. And a lot of them have been uh, leaving the region. And the exact numbers I don't have in front of me, but it, it, I, I found there were some there were some points in the report that were pretty misleading where it left out those parts. And the thing is, is that when I, when, when I brought them up um, and I kind of asked people about it who, was ex who were accepting these uh, stories as fact, they said, well, those are Chinese kind of statistics. You can't really trust them. And it's like, well, well, well hold on a second. It's like you either want to trust them or you don't. The, the report is based on Chinese statistics. And then when we dig a little bit deeper and we say, hold on a second, there's some uh, mismatches here. They say, well, don't trust Chinese data. You know what I mean? But this ties in. The, the reason why, uh, I, I mean, you can look at the story back on BuzzFeed also. And I've, 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 I've had. So, sorry, I've, so can I add something here? Yeah, yeah. So the, the there was a population decline about post 2009 because of the okay. Urumqi riots but that that and that went back up especially the crack you know the terrorist attacks sort of after that uh the opening of the concentration camps and we saw Uyghurs leaving en masse to work in in the factories in in inner China uh so from from memory I, I don't I remember the statistics the the Han Chinese grew in population and we probably looked that up uh in the last three years 
So I would okay. argue against yeah. that. Um, wrong, but, yeah. Uh, we, we can we yeah we can check that out uh, yeah. out after. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 still the the really problematic thing for me was about because this isn't a, a one time thing. I've I've seen these stories change over and over, and I've had people who take issue with me uh, bringing up. Uh, at least some skepticism about it and say, well, hold on a second here. And then they'll, they'll come onto my feed and say, oh, you know, I am, you know, my uncle is missing and, you know, can you please help find him just to kind of, you know, shut me up this way. And then when you look into their history, it's the same thing. Their story has changed over and over and over and over again. The reason I took a specific issue with um, the sterilization story also was because we've seen this before. Uh, this was used against Tibet also. And now we're far enough away from when they used those stories in the 60s that uh, there are reputable organizations that went in and said, actually, there's no evidence that this was ever happening. And this ties into another topic that I want to talk about with you, because uh, one, of the, one of the reasons people are skeptical about this is because the U.S. and a lot of NGOs from the U.S. are really at the forefront of pushing some of these stories uh, through. And they have a clear motive to want to amplify this story of uh, China being a massive human rights abuser. And the thing I really appreciated about you was that you admitted that the U.S. is more or less using Uyghurs for their political fight. Um, and you're probably well aware how quickly the U.S. discards their assets after they've kind of outlived their usefulness. But what I'm curious about is if you see the same possible is issues with Adrian Zenz, because a lot of the reports are coming from him um, and and it, all, all these kind of this data has his signature on it. But he never spoke up before for Muslims. And he's an evangelistic cr uh, Christian who says non-believers will burn in hell. And he's led by a mission by God against China. So do you ever think you're being used by him also and you're also going to be discarded by him afterwards? Um, I've heard those statements about him through Chinese state media. I, I personally haven't heard. I'm, I've interviewed Adrian. Mm -hmm. I personally have not heard, uh, you know, those intentions of him. I don't it's get that feeling. The mission, the mission from God. It's in his book, <laughs> you know, so. But, okay, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I would have to read his book and then comment because I can't, I can't comment on what I haven't <laughs> seen. Um, yeah. I, I can't say either, either or. Um, but, yeah, you're definitely right. Uh, because the we say the oppression, at least under Chinese communist rule, has been happening for 70 years. And America has played a big part in making China what it is today, how powerful it is. Um, and they don't care about... And, and, and I'll be frank with you. Do you think Donald Trump actually cares about human rights? I mean, uh, yeah. I'll be the first to admit this, and I believe, I personally believe, um, if Ch if Trump got China to sign whatever trade deal he wanted, the Uyghur Human Rights Bill, um, he wouldn't have, it still would have gone through because of the congressmen and senators because they're so unanimous, but he wouldn't have put his signature on it because yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, uh, he yeah. got his, he would have had his deal. So I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, in terms of the U.S., the U.S. in 2003 listed the East Turkestan movement as a uh, Islamic movement as a terrorist organization. They've still, like I've said, been bombing uh, them as late as. Uh, the, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The 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 East Turkestan Islamic Party, yes, but not the East Turkestan Independence Movement. Like, okay, the the party like, specifically. Like so, okay, so, okay. So, so the group that aligns themselves with uh, Al Qaeda, yeah, terrorists yeah. of like right. all Uyghurs you know like right-minded Uyghurs would say this um uh gone off to a tangent what was i going uh, so the so the america you so um yeah so i i worry about november and i worry that trump might change his tune and what happens if the left um uh you know are voted in and and you're right because where was obama you know what did bush do i mean this oppression you know you know, as I met, I, I've listed all the oppression, uh, I've listed all the massacres in 1990, 97, 2009, you know, where were they? So uh, at the moment, the Uyghurs' plight and America's self-interest are aligning. And my worry is, it's not even my worry, uh, my worry is what's going to happen when they don't align. And number two, um, even if the Uyghurs were not speaking, one, you wouldn't have heard about me. Because to be honest, the, the the US media and mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the Western media that they boost voices like mine, right? That's yeah, that's we, what the we, yeah. We wouldn't be having this interview, but the oppression is still real. Even like uh, America, you know, you know, blanket statement okay. murdering Muslims, but the oppression right now is still real. And whether or not sterilization is real or not, you know, based on witness testimony, 
I mean, you know, let's just be frank here. As I mentioned, I can't contact my father-in-law. He can't come. I, I know people that I have a very close friend. Uh, she and her sister, they, they are out in the world. Their mother, their father, their two brothers, they haven't been able to contact them for three years. Um, and the latest news that they got is that they've actually been sentenced uh, anywhere between seven to 19 years. I think yeah. mother got seven, dad got 11, and God knows what for. Um, yeah. Right, and, yeah. I'll, and, I'll get into, yeah. I, and, I, I, and, and another thing, can I just ask? Yeah. Forget Uyghurs. Are you able to interview anyone in China who's Chinese that speaks out against the Chinese government, let's just say against coronavirus? Is this possible on your part? Um, I, I could, yeah. I mean, I have, um, I've had discussions with people on my channel where they talk about the things that, for example, I, I interviewed um, a friend of mine who was on the streets on the Tiananmen Square protest, and he spoke about the things that he didn't like about the government. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a lot more open than people think. Now, if I wanted to publish that video in China, that's a different story. I, I, I can't, I, I can't do that. So there is, there is censorship here. That is the, uh, that, that is undeniable. Um, but, you know, and, and people are able to go to Xinjiang. And I'm going to get into that topic um, a, a little bit more in a second. But I think maybe it, it might be important to um, explain why uh, people want to speak up uh, 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 about possible skepticisms on the Xinjiang story, even though they know they're going to be absolutely roasted for questioning the legit legitimacy of human rights abuse stories. Uh, because we've seen time and time again where stories are being uh, pushed, which end up being fake, but they were used to excuse military inventions that have killed millions of people. People, whether it be from um, you know Syria and the fake news about the Viagra pumped up soldiers, or the nurses who were crying during their testimony about babies being thrown from their incubators by Iraqi soldiers, we now know that that was fake, and it led to excusing a lot of death and destruction. But had you disagreed with that crying nurse at the time, you have would have been destroyed in the media, you know. But now we're faced with a potential conflict between two far more powerful countries, and and, and so I, I want to put that out there, and I want to make sure I want to ask you: Do you do you understand and appreciate the need for healthy skepticism from others, um, or do you just kind of despise anybody who 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 even wants to kind of go question it? Uh, you know what. The, mm -hmm. um, I if I were to if I were to portray, uh, you know, I I, I self censor as well. I censor myself because there are a lot of stories that you wouldn't believe, and uh, that that's nothing what you've just said, uh, so far fetched that I don't even say. But some mm -hmm. Uyghurs are willing to put out there, and I do my best to say, you know what, that's that sounds realistic or that doesn't sound realistic, um, and sometimes I get it wrong. But there are so many stories out there that are. And the Uyghurs tell me, but I'm like, nah, man, that you, give me something. Give me something that I can use to be able to make that statement. And so at least the stuff that I say, um, that, that there is some sort of evidence there, at least from my experience or people that uh, that were there at the beginning of 2017, the things that they saw and um, the little bits of information that they're able to get from friends and family via WeChat um, or via Douyin. So... I understand. So you, have, yeah, you have a process. You have a process to authenticate yeah. and make sure that what, what you're, you know, there's an authenticity to what you're presenting. Yeah. I, I want to actually hone in on uh, the one thing that you talked about, um, putting things out there that aren't a little bit, too, aren't too far fetched, and that you have a process of authenticating, um, or or at least trying to get the information right. So I, I know that one of the big ones I wanted to talk about was on, on your China Unscripted podcast interview. You said that the local Turkic language is banned in public areas now, but all the street signs, all the restaurant menus are all still in Arabic characters. And anyone who goes to Xinjiang can hear the local language in the streets. So, so how, how, how can this be, how can this be true? And where, where, where do you get that information? Uh, from, from the people that I interviewed, uh, they, they are, they were told in the camps that they are only to use Chinese and, and th there is a situation where 1.1 million cutters or Chinese officials went and lived with Chinese, uh, Uyghur, in Uyghur homes. And this is, uh, you can read about it, whether you believe it or not, but you can read about it. Just type in 1.1 million Chinese officials living in with Uyghurs mm -hmm. um, and they were specifically there to see if they prayed, whether they used the Uyghur language um, at home. 
And uh, apparently from what they're telling me, this is what they were doing. And they were also hooked up so uh, to, to raise ethnic harmony. Every Uyghur had to be, they had to have a Uyghur, sorry, they had to have a Han Chinese partner, a family member, a relative. So when I interviewed uh, Zumrat Dawood, uh, she said uh, she was partnered with a Han Chinese man. Um, her daughter, 12-year-old daughter, was partnered with a 21-year-old Chinese man, and she would call her to say, you know what, I'm picking up your daughter tomorrow. We're going to go and, you know, have fun here, have fun there. And she would constantly give excuses uh, to not do that. Apparently, uh, he, he called three or four times. So visiting each other, and she told me that when the Uyghurs visited the Han Chinese homes to uh, create this harmony, she was given a plate of pork to eat. And Zumrat said, you know, I can't eat this pork to the to the to her Han Chinese guests. And and the woman, she was very nice. She said, you know what? I just need to have a picture of you eating it. So if you could just get your chopstick, you know, and have the meat in front of your mouth as if you are eating, so I can send it off to hire. This is what she told me. Right. Um, so it's not just language, it's this whole you know, yeah. I mean, if that's if that's if that obviously if that's happening, that's completely yeah. um, outrageous, as, of course. But and 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 there's a lot of stories like this that that come up that there's no real way to counteract it because it's a testimonial. It's just saying this, yeah. they, they're saying what happened. But in terms of the language, that's something I can say. I can say if they're not allowed to speak in public areas, why is the language everywhere? Why why are is, are there Arabic characters all in the streets? Why can you hear people in the public places still speaking? Um, uh, uh, the local language because that that doesn't add up. That's one thing I can say. Hold on a second. Well, well, the question will be: Well, why why are there mosques in some of these areas? Just because there are mosques doesn't mean that people are allowed to practice. We say it's for show. We say you know, pom ticking. It's kind of like North Korea. You know, I'm sure you've heard you've seen this North Korean tour shows where you know people are put on tour. So to show the Arabic, but we have images where the Arabic script has been taken down. We have seen images in Hui areas where the Arabic script and the, the halal sign has been taken down. So you get both. There are images of it being taken down and and, and um, you can see the Arabic, like the shade of the Arabic script that used to be there. And then you also see it being flaunted for everyone to see. So when tourists come in, especially when you, uh, when they go to Urumqi or even when they do go to Kashgar, the city center, we say it is for show. So, but so yeah. when, when they go, all of these street signs, all of these menus, all of the people uh, out and around speaking in the local language, they're, they're props. They're just like in case tourists show up just so that they can see that the language is still happening. I mean, do you understand why it's, it sounds yeah, yeah. a bit... Yeah, I understand what um, you're and, and their ID cards. Their ID cards have uh, Arabic characters on it also. Is that in case a tourist asks to see their ID card? I mean, th this doesn't add up for me. So, uh, as I said, in public, in public, uh, whether or not the people on the street are actually speaking the Uyghur language, and, and I've seen clips in there uh, that they do, but in school, in public arena. I mean, in the streets, it'd be pretty, it'd be really hard to govern. It'd be really hard to govern. But we say that the Uyghur, Uyghur language, Uyghur culture is being decimated. But the culture, what's interesting is you'll see dancing and 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 the Han and the, the Chinese government, what they try to do is, so we, we have like bread or dry fan, you know, like they'll go mm -hmm. Xinjiang Nang, Xinjiang, you know, you okay. know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And look at, this is ours. So right now, yeah, great food there, also. Yeah. So yeah. the besides the language, there there is also one part where the, where they're having the the Chinese people that live or have resided in Xinjiang for many years uh, take on the Uyghur culture to say that these are Uyghurs. This is Xinjiang. This is, you know what I mean. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll be so so for for that. I mean, I'll be honest. For me, that that doesn't add up. And I mean, here in in Shenzhen, also nobody's coming here to see a Muslim community in Shenzhen. But there's three mosques here. Um, there's a family that uh, just down the street from me, um, Hui Muslim family, who owns a restaurant, and their kids mm -hmm. go to the mosque to learn Arabic characters on the weekends. So for me, that 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 uh, I I know we're getting two different sets of information, but yeah. this is one of the things that that really. Uh, 
is one, it's one of the things that makes me say, hold, hold on a second here. Now, mm-hmm. uh, there was uh, talking about some of these other stories that there was um, uh, one story you cover a lot is organ harvesting. And there were stories you posted of, uh, you know, three, 300 children being frozen alive, which was debunked uh, yeah. since then. But your, your China un- Unscripted po- podcast, you mentioned that there's a huge market from the Gulf area countries to get halal organs from Uyghur prisoners in Xinjiang. So can you tell me a little bit more about, about this? What, what, what is this and how was this kind of verified or how, how do we know this is going on? So, one, uh, the story initially broke out on Radio Free Asia Chinese channel. There's a Uyghur surgeon uh, by the name of Anwar Tohti, who currently resides in London. Um, and he was the first uh, Uyghur sur- if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, the first Uyghur surgeon. And he, uh, to carry out this organ uh, harvesting in 1995, where they got uh, someone, uh, they executed uh, somebody and and he was half dead. He wasn't fully dead and he harvested the organs of this man uh, while he was half alive. Um, there are lanes in Kashgar, in airports, and you can see this on social media. Now, you know in Chinese culture and even in Uyghur culture, Organ donation, donating is no one, you know, it's it's not a thing. Why do you have in Kashgar, of all places, this, uh, you, what, what's the word? Like this transit lane, so like to, to fast forward people who are carrying organs to, to the people that need them. Now, we do not have hardcore evidence or documentation about this issue. But suddenly, we say there is an Islamic ban. But now you've got, say, Tongshan uh, Hospital, uh, I believe it's in Beijing, advertising. You've got people from the Middle East, and they've interviewed that you know, they're from Oman, they're from Qatar, they're from all these places, and they've got Muslim canteens. So a lot, a, a lot of these issues um, that are that are popping up, they are again from witness testimonials, and we've suddenly got. Um, say, pro-Muslim hospitals out there. You, you've got so many people coming in from the Middle East for these transplants uh, that, that, that they are setting up these so-called Muslim hospitals. And, you, and you've also got these various surgeons that were interviewed secretly. I'm not sure if you've seen this. They're on YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. And, and uh, they mentioned that, the, that these organs were coming from Uyghurs. And the main... The main Journalist writing about this is CJ Werleman because he was able to interview Anwar Tohti. Um, but wh- whether, but for the primary evidence, we do not have this primary sourced evidence where you know. You see, this, th- th- this is this. Yeah, this is one of the places where I have an issue. Also, is because you know on on July nineteenth, you tweeted that that twenty five thousand Uyghurs per year have their organs harvested, and if this is such a huge issue, if this is such a massive thing, and you you you. To, to have 25,000 Uyghur's organs har- har- harvested and no hard evidence, it just seems a little bit too big. I mean, you should have at least have some advertising uh, campaigns in the Gulf region to say, hey, we can get you halal organs. But we're, we're, all we have is testimonials. So I don't know if you can see why this would be one of those things that gets somebody's spidey senses going also saying, oh, oh, hang on a second. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. The, the 25,000 uh, I got from Ethan Gutman. Uh, based on, he bases it on something. So I, I use that. So I said based on Ethan Gutman, twenty five thousand uh, a year uh, mm. disappearances. Uh, but again, to to clear all this, instead of China spending so much money on propaganda, just let people in. You know, visit. I mean, they the invited. Area. They invited the European Union in uh, last week or two weeks ago, and they said, "Come again, you know, come come in." And they refused, you know. Mm, they, they, yeah, but, yeah, but they knew it wasn't going to be independent. That they wanted to go on the ground themselves and not be chaperoned. You know, uh, for me, for me, this is what I think. I think if 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 somebody believes that there is an extremism problem, if they believe there is a terrorism problem, I think it would be the equivalent of of asking somebody to just you know go to uh, Guantanamo Bay where they have Uyghur prisoners also and say, okay, you can go around and, and travel, you know, go through this center by yourself. They want to bring these people into the centers. They want to talk. They want to show them the prisons, everything like this. But um, I, uh, for me personally, I feel like it's uh, reasonable that you're going to have somebody 
kind of with you on a trip like that. As a tourist, as a regular tourist, we can go there freely. We Nobody's following us around. I think you probably saw the interview with um, uh, Jerry, an uh, Australian British man mm-hmm. who, yeah, he he rode his bro- bike through, he's been to Xinjiang five times or six times, and he rode his bike from one side of Xinjiang to the other. Um, people are allowed to go there. People are allowed to check it out. Um, but you know, if you watch the documentary Isabel Young made, she went in as a tourist and she was mm-hmm. stopped constantly. Like, I'm not sure if you watched the, I think it's the most is popular. She, is she a journalist? She is a journalist, but she didn't go as a journalist. She went on a tourist visa. She went in there. I'm, I'm uh, pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they'll know. They'll know that she's a, a journalist. Uh, I, I'm they're pretty sure they can look that up. But but moving on. So th- yeah, those are some of the. Yeah. Can I and mention something that you know? East Turkestan is not Guantanamo Bay, though. Ob- obviously, you you you're going to be the region wanna- as a whole. Yeah, no, it's yeah, not. Yeah, you, you're going to want to be chaperoned in Guantanamo Bay. Um, but as as far as the region. As you mentioned, people should be able to I- investigate free. I mean, what if they've got nothing to hide, you know? And 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 there are areas. I mean, uh, I think Jerry was his name. He said no areas are blocked, but journalists were blocked all the time. Yeah, but- I, I mean, I, I think uh, the one thing that uh, China does really poorly is the the whole media thing. Even their own media is just kind of it's pathetic to be honest. I mean, they they don't know how to speak to international audiences, and I think they've seen when people come in, when journalists come in and they look at the issue and they go home and to completely misrepresent the story, or um, if it's if it's a foreign interference problem, you know, we've seen like for example, Vice they did a, a documentary, they did something on uh, the the reeducation camps in in Xinjiang. BBC did one also, and it was the whole piece was on what they didn't see, what they think was happening, not what they on well, what they did see. But with Vice in particular, they did one on China, and then they also did one on Indonesia, uh, where they were uh, uh, reeducating the children of terrorists, and 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 Vice covered it completely differently. They put beautiful music over top. They invented a new word called debrainwashing. And I think they know, they say, people are going to come in, they're going to come in with an agenda, and this is what's going to happen. That's my perspective. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Maybe the better thing to do is still say, have at it. We know you're going to write what you want anyway. So you know, perhaps I can agree with you somewhat on that. But that's what my perspective is on that. But kind of continuing this uh, topic about some of the things that... Uh, get those kind of skepticism, spidey senses going. Um, you, you mentioned on, um, I think it was on the China Unscripted podcast that there was uh, 13 tons of human hair that was seized by U.S. Customs, which came from Xinjiang women. And the only reports I saw from the U.S. is that, that the hair was synthetic. And as far as I know, they never confirmed it to be human hair yet. But you, you seem to be pretty sure that it is and mentioned that it's a $1.8 billion per year industry. So from my perspective also, I, I feel like if 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 the hair of Uyghur women was being shaved off like this it, it, to to, to amounts of one point eight billion dollars worth per year, you'd think we'd see far more photos of bald Uyghur women while you're walking around. Why why aren't we seeing this? Are they you know before they're released? Do they have to grow their hair back fully? And and where does this information come from? So that the information of the statistics, um, I got the statistics from Radio Free Asia's. Uh, on the story, which was initially written by uh, Guljik Rahoja, which is who she's mm-hmm. the main journalist there. And I believe, I'm not sure where she got it from, uh, but I would have to go back. So that, that's where I got that $1.8 billion. It started off around $100 million and it's gone up. And the... From Radio, and Radio, Free, uh, Radio Free Asia. Yeah, Radio Free Asia. And it's it looks like, you know, uh, the... The, the assumption it's coming from Xinjiang and we say it looks like it's coming from the camps, like this amount of hair. Uh, the interviews done by Ethan Goodman, mm-hmm. uh, he had uh, interviewed people, uh, the women, they said they had to put their head through a hole and then their heads were shaved. So again, uh, witness testimonials again, and, and it's very hard to get, and I and I know what you're going to say with this, but this is what we're dealing. Uh, this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. So that's where that information came from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, you you do you do know what I'm going to say because yeah, yeah, it's it's again, it's like where is the hard evidence? And do you see do you see a problem with Radio Free Asia? Have you looked into them? Do you know about their track record? Do you know who they're funded by? And does it raise any concerns also where you say? Okay, you know, hold on a second. There might be some issues here with this information, or is it because they're 
uh, you know, and I, I know we, we all do this. Everybody does this is where they look for uh, uh, people saying things that reaffirm what they what they what they uh, want to hear. Um, you know, this is not a, 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 a hit against you specifically. We yeah. all have these things that we need to catch ourselves on. But don't don't you I mean, you must know about the issues with Radio Free Asia in terms of funding and they're kind of wh yeah. who's backing them. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that issue, but um, a lot of what I, uh, the reports that I take seriously is that, especially the ones with the with the missing family members, and um, I, I know the reporters there. I have personal connections with them, and yeah, uh, and the the great thing that they do is they they are actually able to call in, and you and when you actually hear Chinese officials or people on the ground saying what's happening, so. Uh, th there was one about the the pork that the Uyghurs are actually slaughtering pigs now, um, and, and and the testimony that they gave in the guy in the Uyghur language was like for us it's it, it's 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 unheard of, um, right. and so th th they're able to get that information especially when they're getting the news from like officials and they don't know they don't realize who they're talking to but they give a lot of information, and um, unfortunately not all of that is translated into the English language. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, right, the, right, I, yeah. I believe there are, or the, the top is under investigation or something, the, yeah. you know, name. yeah. Um, so on to some of the, uh, I just have a couple more here that, um, yeah. the, the, and I appreciate you taking all this time, um, was that I, I took, uh, one of my original, well, interactions or retweets from you was I took a lot of issue with some of the, the, uh, reposted videos that you pulled down from uh, Douyin from the Chinese yeah. TikTok, and um, I kind of I kind of laid into you a bit on that one. I, I you didn't you didn't interact with me, you ignored it, and and that's yeah. why I'm also really greatly appreciative of that. Even though I laid into you on that a bit, you're here talking to me. Yeah. But you know, one of one of the videos that um, w was the one that stood out for me the most most was that you you posted a picture of a girl, a weaker girl in a, in what seemed to be a classroom, uh, crying, and and you said that she was crying because she was separated from her parents who were locked up. But to me, I've got four kids that look like an ordinary kid in uh, in a in a kindergarten, just like my kids look like when they're being dropped off early on, uh, crying. And 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 when you look at the original Douyin account that was it was connected to, they didn't say anything about what you were saying. They had beautiful music over top of it. So how did that turn into a story about a little girl being separated from her parents? And it's just not an ordinary kid at school suffering from separation anxiety. So that's the mistake on my part. Um, the and and a lot of us do this, and uh, I I don't think, if I'm not mistaken, I never posted another child crying again after that, because uh, once I saw comments about you know what my child cries in um, childcare when I, when I drop them off, uh, and my kid does as well, there was actually I did not have any evidence. Uh, that 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 was a situation and that was an emotional tweet because that, that that's what other Uyghurs were saying and that was that was my inexperience I shouldn't have posted even if I had posted I should have just written Uyghur kid crying in kindergarten and I should have stopped off there so you're right yeah I, I, I don't you know <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there wasn't, I, I know you haven't posted, I, I think a lot of people took issue with that one and I know you yeah. haven't posted anything like that, but there wasn't really a, a, a retraction. Yeah. Like I, I know I've posted some stuff that I got caught on that was kind of fake. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. And uh, Pakistan um, internet connection is acting up a bit. It might have to switch routers again, but, um, it, it, but I, I personally, I just think you should have followed up because a lot of people, a lot of people also retweeted that thinking it was real to put an addition saying, okay, guys, sorry, I messed up on this one. Um, and I think it would help your case um, if, if you showed that, okay, I'm willing to admit this. Sure, not doing that again is 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 is, is a good good thing also. But to specifically stay, say, say, I got caught by the fake, you know, fake news. That's my kind of, you know, personal opinion. Yeah, uh, at, at the same time, even though I didn't have proof that, you know, because the a lot of what the Uyghurs were saying and just on social media was that, um, you know, th that that was one of the, what's the call, like the kindergartens where those kids, know, all their parents are in the in the camps. And I left it there because maybe one day it does turn out to be that, you know, but at that point in time, no, I did not have the evidence. So I left it there uh, right. without it. Um, right, right, right. Uh, yeah.
that that, okay, that was there, there was another i mean there, there's a lot of a lot of doyin videos that you've you've pulled down in the yeah. past and I'm, i only want to ask about one one other one which was yeah. um there was a video of two older uyghur women smiling and drinking together i think they were drinking yeah. jagermeister yeah. and and you said that they were being forced to drink alcohol even though in xinjiang yeah. like we said they've been drinking wine for yeah. 2000 years yeah. uh, since the 4th century bc so yeah. wh again why they looked perfectly happy they were drinking why did this turn into a story of them being forced by the ccp how did that turn into that story again it, that was the same issue uh there were other videos uh where there were beer drink, drinking competitions and again that that was in an inexperience on my part um yeah uh what, what, when did i post that um, I think it, it must have been at least at least six months ago or so, or uh, maybe even I can't remember exactly. No, um, it wouldn't have been. I, I think it was more than a year. Like uh, with with Twitter, I only started using it uh, at the beginning of 2018, and I just I've been, yeah, no, not 2018, 2019, and yeah. so I there are a lot of posts where I I was experienced in you know in in verification uh, verification and that there's a process, and I actually took uh, a two week course on verifying and backtracking oh. and you know looking things up and yeah that, that that that's that's uh that's my bad on my part yeah right right okay so i mean th these are things though that contribute towards some of the skepticism yeah. um you know Definitely, the, big, I agree. The, 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 the the big one also is though the, the this number also you know obviously they're saying they um yeah the one million or two million and it goes up to three million sometimes uyghurs mm -hmm. in concentration camps and i uh, you know there's people who search and search and search for this number where does it come from you know i know max blumenthal spoke to uh the uh, omar Kanat at the world uyghur congress and, mm. and uh, he said uh, yeah the media gets their information from him and then a few seconds later he says he gets his information from the media and it was an endless circle but then finally yeah. somebody found that the number came from eight people uh from a particular area i, I believe it was in um kashgar and they uh basically took their testimonies and then extrapolated it across the entire population of xinjiang and it was like hold on a second that's not very scientific so do you i mean how is that the number that you're basing it on also or w w yeah w you go ahead yeah I don't think that was the case. Um, I believe, again, this goes back to Adrian Zenz. Uh, mm -hmm. He got it off uh, Chinese websites. And I think Sean Jang also did a similar thing where they were where they were counting the, the, the sale of beds. And also, if you look at Sean Jang's blog, where he, he's got all the coordinates of the camps. And so uh, they would, in my mind, this is the process that they did. I'm not sure exactly what they went through. They 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 counted the number of camps or what they suspected were camps the size of the camps and then they and then they counted uh they got stuff from open source and like the beds and the other materials i forget the list of materials that they had bed sheets and food and tables and chairs and all this, and then they made a guesstimate that way but what was interesting was if i were to ask you the que the question of the Uyghur population in east turkestan Based on Chinese statistics, what's your answer? So I think that, uh, well, I know the Muslim population they put out, I think about 10, 10 million, is it somewhere around there? So the yeah. Uyghur population, they must be putting it much lower than that. If I would take, without it in front of me, I would take, I, I guess yeah. they're saying six or seven million. Um, you, you can actually just take it from me because, um, and you can find this uh, on, and this has been reported on CGTN and it's in mm -hmm. Xinjiang Bureau population statistics themselves. They say the Uyghur population is anywhere between eleven and twelve million. Oh, and okay, you, okay. And you would constant, you constantly hear this as well, and yeah. you can just take it because five minutes later you can look it up and it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. I take. I, I, yeah. But what was interesting was in September two thousand eighteen, um, and and again, this eleven, twelve million, eleven, twelve million, ten million is constantly said about the Uyghur population. But then you had someone like Victor Gao, Chinese spokesperson. I believe it was September 2018 on Al Jazeera when he was being interviewed by Mehdi, Mehdi Hassan. And I've got the tweet as well. He says the Uyghurs are six, six, seven million people. And that scared me because how do you go from 11? And this was one off. He said 10, 11, 12, 10. He's, he yeah. said this. And on CGTN, yeah. they report 10, 11, 12 million Uyghurs. And so the argument was, you know, uh, they went with the most conservative number on 1 million. And Victor yeah. Gao was worried. How could you say 1 million Uyghurs are in concentration camps when there is only 6 to 7 million Uyghurs? 
that's like 20 or 15 20 percent of the population don't right. scare me and i was like what where did five people go? <laughs> well, you know, so granted, I, I made the same mistake just now. I didn't have the number in front of me. But if he's a spokesperson, he should uh, ideally he, not be making a mistake like that. Yes. Yeah, so, so for example, what's the current? So that's like forty yeah. percent less or forty-five percent less. What he's saying, right? Yeah. So, for uh, example, what, what's the what's the American population right now? Like three hundred yeah, million, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And if I suddenly said, "Oh, it's two two hundred two hundred fifty million, wouldn't that? Well, we're, you know what I mean? We're not going to be worried no, about it. I, 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 can, I can understand why that would be a red flag. I mean, it could have been him uh, misspeaking, but valid point that that would yeah. come up. But what, what you're talking about is these, th this is what I'm seeing also, though, is that extrapolating the number of beds sold or the number of this kind of stuff sold and then jumping to a conclusion as ter in terms of what it means or, you know, the birth rates going down in the major cities, which happens everywhere in every developing city as it becomes more prosperous and jumping to that meaning that uh, uh, sterilizing are going on. This is um, th th this is kind of my 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 concern also. But undeniably, I think you you know though that the, the original number they, that everybody then tried to go out and search to match up with it and say, okay, yes, there's a bunch of beds being sold, so it must match this. The original one was those eight uh, kind of the eight 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 folks who uh, gave some data and then they extrapolated across the entire uh, population. I don't know if you traced it back to that also that original report, but um, these are uh, uh, these are some of the things that um, kind of also raise some concerns uh, as far as uh, what I'm hearing from the kind of more skeptical side. yeah yeah but but the thing is right at the end of the day, yeah, let's just say it's all fake. At the end of the day, Every single person that I know, um, they still don't have at least, forget camps, mm -hmm. they cannot contact their parents, man. And that's real. That, 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 like, that, that you can be sure of. Um, and at the end of the day, with my story, my father-in-law at the end of the day does not have a passport. They won't give him a passport. He cannot come. He hasn't been charged. He's an actor and, and, and he's very famous. So can you imagine if it wasn't for his clout, what sort of situation he would be in and and that's that's real yeah and you know? i believe i believe it's real i believe that you're saying that you he's not contacting you or that he can't get his passport um uh, what exactly for why i mean you know when, when people look and, at and, uh, and, and and it's not just me this guy has given service to the ccp this is someone um right. his top ranking and he and he's been in plays and movies with some top chinese actors in china chinese actors uh, never broken a law in his life, um, you know, and, and and I'm not the only one. There are others like writers, journalists, uh, university professors, doctors, footballers, singers. I mean, these guys, and you know, in China, you're not necessarily independent from the government. If you're a performer of some sort, you're linked mm -hmm. to the government. Everything that you do is censored one way or another. So it, it's... I mean that that that's real. The others, yeah. yes. Testimony, no, you know, I I I don't. You know, that's the the when when somebody want when somebody looks at the stories of our past where there were and and I don't want to do this. I don't want to say all of these people are lying. Uh, I, I I don't I don't I don't even believe that. I believe that there are true reasons why there are some people who are apprehended in China, or there are true reasons why they're having a difficulty getting a, a passport. Whether it's legitimate or not, I I, I won't kind of comment on that. But because we have a precedent of uh, testimonials, uh, testimonies uh, being used uh, to push a certain story, and then it ended up later on saying, "Oh my God, you know, this is all for for this purpose," um, and and maybe you know some people obviously um, sometimes have some individual uh, goals also, whether it be uh, uh, seeking asylum or getting passports in certain countries. But I don't want to I don't want to marginalize people like that because I'm sure some of these stories are true. But I still think we need more hard evidence like we're, we 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 keep hearing this word over and over again saying that there is no hard evidence this is a, this is a massive thing on this scale we need something a little bit more than this we need to stop getting in a situation where so many people whose stories are changing are are uh, are happening or with you you're sometimes getting caught by you know and i know you've said you 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 admit that that was wrong Posting these things that are debunked later, saying, "Hold on a second, why, why, why is this happening?" Or, you know, Rushan Abbas, who does her AMA um, to um, 
say that I'm a Uyghur uh, activist with a uh, family that's missing in Xinjiang, ask me anything. And then when people uncovered that she worked for the CIA in Guantanamo Bay overseeing Uyghurs who were detained by the US, you know, people were only asking her questions about that. What was it like working for the CIA? Do you feel uh, there's any level of hypocrisy here that you were working, detaining them in Guantanamo Bay, now you're speaking up for them in Xinjiang? Like, these are all things that happen. Uh that, that I don't think her capacity was to detain them. She was there on translator. A translating. As she wasn't, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, so she's working there in Guantanamo Bay. She's got nothing to say about, she. She well, she, she did actually come out on Twitter uh, and say that uh, Guantanamo Bay is better than Xinjiang, which, I yeah. mean, um, I think we, we know about the, the kind of waterboarding stories and all of this kind of stuff that's going on in there. I, I think that is one of the most absurd statements I've uh, ever heard. Um, the, you know. uh, I think what she meant was, yes, there, 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 there were, I don't even know if there still are, because again, uh, I don't fully believe in all the time Western media as well. But if the stories are true, Mm -hmm. that the, the people can pray their prayer mats, they're allowed to fast and they're given special diets and they're allowed to have the Qur'an in that capacity. And if those stories are true, that they're able to have the, the book because this is what former de Guantanamo detainees have said, that the, uh, even uh, Mozambique, he said, compared to what we describe what's happening there, he said, well, Guantanamo Bay was better because they're, they're praying in congregation. Every, they're allowed to have beads and... Yeah. And I mean, I, I have, I mean, obviously I've, I've been living here in China for 12 years and I know uh, people, like I said, the, 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 the Uyghur woman also um, who admits that when she travels, it's a, 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 she's targeted in terms of having her documents checked and stuff like that. Yeah. And I know people here who are, their kids are going to the mosques here and they're studying Islam. And, 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 but I don't, I, I try not to use those because it's kind of like, uh, my the people I know their word against the people you know their word and it just does, it doesn't go anywhere and that's why I'd really like to focus on hard evidence and I, I hope that um, there's an appreciation also that if um, even though there even though I believe that there's a good reason for skepticism on this topic if the people who are skeptical and who speak up and say hold on guys we should demand more from this if it turns out they're wrong and everything you're saying is right and all of these things are going on that will never, ever leave us. We will be roasted the rest of our lives for that. You know, you were a, a yeah. genocide denier or something like that. But yeah. we still put ourselves out there because I think even if it ends up being true, it's the right thing to do to say, hold on a second. Why are these things not adding up? Why is this story keep changing? Now, on the other end, if there was a journalist or somebody who keeps pushing this story of saying th there's a genocide going on and they end up being wrong. The consequences for them, even though they were doing the wrong thing, pushing this without enough evidence, in my opinion, the consequences for them are nowhere near as severe as the people who are saying, okay, guys, give us a little bit more to work with here. And I hope I hope there's an appreciation for that, at least. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, for example, I, again, from my experience, forget the camps for a second. Whenever yeah. I used to go, my family would tell me to uh, take off my beard. And, th and this is my family back then. Mm -hmm. Like, take off your beard. And make sure your wife is not covered. And my wife would go with a beanie. She would walk around with a beanie. And okay. all the women there, most of the time, like, you know, she's walking around with a beanie. And as soon as she, we, we came back, you know, outside of China, she's back in her headscarf. And, like, I, I've experienced, and, and I'm a foreigner. Because what would happen is, if I don't take this off, you, you know that, Either I have to register at a hotel or I register wh with whoever I'm staying and they're harboring someone that practices and that has a beard. Th th this is what the people on the ground are saying. And so, are you, so, and so, so if you, if, um, I mean, I, I'm not paid by anyone. I'm a teacher. I live away from my family just to make ends meet. I mean, yeah, this, this right. is my experience at the border. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, we've we've got uh, and and so I've been through um uh, through uh, through Tibet a lot. I'm actually going there the day after tomorrow too, and and have a lot of uh, kind of uh, Muslim friends here in China with a different set of experiences. But I mean, you know, let, let's definitely you know you've you spent two hours. Thank you so much for your time. We've been going on, I, I, you know, uh, but let let's stay in contact and and try to have a, a more constructive dialogue about this. And uh, when you come across um, you know, physical hard evidence, or you want to run something by me, what are my thoughts on it? You're more than welcome to, you know, I've really appreciated that you've taken this time and, um, 
you know, I think maybe we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. And, you know, I know I, I'm a beer drinker. I'm guessing you're not. <laughs> so, but one day, maybe if we're, you know, our, 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 our paths cross, we can sit down for a coffee or a tea together, but I really appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. No, anytime. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. Yeah. We'll stay in touch.